guys. Welcome to the show. 888-659-3727. Thank you so much for being patient. Uh, as you know, this is uh, live internet broadcasting, so there's always some slight issue, but, you know, we got it up and running. Thank goodness. Listen, if you're new to the program, don't know who I am or why I am here. Uh, I am a consumer advocate for men and women dealing with hair loss. I am the author of a couple of very well-known books on the subject of the prevention and treatment of hair loss. And, I, you know, I am a guy who has been, unfortunately, dealing with hair loss for, God, a, a couple of decades now. And I can tell you, if you are new to this broadcast, this is your safe place. This is a place for men and women to come and talk about a, an issue that society doesn't really allow us to talk about. This is a place for people who are struggling with the most common disease of the spirit known to man. And obviously that's hair loss. You know, what the mainstream media never really covers is the reality of what hair loss sufferers go through in their everyday lives. Just dealing with the issue of, of their appearance eroding along with their hairlines, or at least in their minds. I can tell you that in my particular situation, uh, when I was a young man, when I was 21 years old, dealing with the initial throes of hair loss, it was absolutely devastating. And I wasn't prepared for it. And there was nothing out there to really help me prepare for it. Everything that I read, everything that was being advertised, everything was self-serving and just complete bullshit. And we're talking about really the dark ages of hair loss, or well, the dark ages of the hair loss industry, I should say, back in the late 80s. My own journey is what led me to do this program. My own journey, my own suffering, my own angst, my inability to find real help or real hope. It led me to do my own research. It led me to do my due diligence. It led me to find ways to help myself and avoid all the bullshit that's being sold out there. And, you know, I have to tell you, we've come a long way over the years in terms of really being able to prevent and treat hair loss. However, it's a $3.5 billion a year industry that sells mostly bullshit. 99% of all products being sold are complete crap, will not help you in any way, shape, or form. And, you know, and that's just the way that it is. But when people are new to the process, they don't understand that. They have, maybe they've seen some article on hair transplantation, or maybe they've seen some media piece, some local media piece on low-level laser therapy for hair loss. Or maybe they've seen, you know, commercials for Rogaine. And they think in their minds, because they weren't really that aware of hair loss because they weren't dealing with it. It kind of comes back that, you know what, wait a second, there's something out there that could help me. Or the hair club for men. Or one of these large chain clinics. And it's because these companies have really come to become part of the fabric of our culture that the misinformation, the the, the the nonsense is continued to just be put out there. The bullshit is what's become a part of the fabric of our culture, somebody's calling me. That's what the hair loss industry really thrives on. You know, and the thing is, there's so much that can really be done now. People can be helped. There are great FDA-approved medications that really work for people. There are a handful, but there are, they, they do exist, of physicians who really understand how to treat hair loss 
or who can perform state-of-the-art surgical hair restoration, but most of what you're going to see is complete and utter bullshit. Now, I was hoping that um, Dr. Glenn Charles uh, was going to call in today. We arranged to have him call in, but I don't see him on the line yet. But I wanted to speak to Dr. Charles about, and I've been speaking about this a lot, And I think it's important that we continue this conversation because I want to deal with the reality of what goes on in this industry. I don't want to focus on, you know, the hopes and the dreams of, of the you know, few thousand people in the message forums who are spending all their time talking about future treatments that have not come to fruition yet, who, that may never come to fruition. Meanwhile, there are thousands of guys who are just wasting precious time doing nothing about their hair loss. This is what I tell people. Either move on, shave your head, figure something out, become comfortable in your own skin as a balding person, or figure out what works within today's parameters. Don't pin your hopes on some study or some group of doctors or some researchers who are working on something that may never, ever come to fruition. Think about what we have today. You know what we have today? We have some great hair transplantation being done. We have less invasive hair transplantation being performed. We have FDA-approved products that may help you stop your hair loss. We have good hair pieces, if that's a choice that you can, you can deal with. But that is it. So if you can't deal with the options that we have today, move on with your life the best that you can. See a shrink. Get plastic surgery if you have to. Do whatever you can to, to make yourself feel better. And I'm not advocating that someone jump you know, into plastic surgery either. But I wanted to have Dr. Charles on the program today, and I don't see him calling in, so I, I don't know if he is busy or just is in transit. Because I've been talking a lot about the artist's hair transplant machine or robot or device. And the reason I'm talking so much about this is because in my view, this is the future of surgical hair restoration. And I said this before, love it or hate it. This is the future. This is the reality of what's happening. Now, there are plenty of doctors out there who are saying, you know, I spoke to uh, an IHS accepted member about this, um, Dr. Parsa Mohibi, who is heading a FUE research committee for the ISHRS. And according to him, the artist isn't quite there yet. But I also spoke to Bob Bernstein a few weeks ago, and, you know, according to him, it is. According to him, this is state-of-the-art FUE. But what I see is the marketing of this field. I see the direction that this field is going in based on the market, based on the demand for less invasive surgical hair restoration, and based on the ability to market a state-of-the-art hair transplant system, a robot, to consumers, and consumers eating it up. Now, I'm not saying that this is an inferior, inferior device. That's a tough word for me. I'm not saying that guys aren't going to get great hair transplants who decide to have an artist hair transplant. But what I am saying is that, love it or hate it, this is the direction that the industry is going in. I think it is imperative that those in the field get together and try to make this device the best it can possibly be. I told you guys a few weeks ago that after this big aesthetics meeting in San Francisco, there was a group of doctors, six of them, who contacted me. There's a board-certified plastic surgeons who contacted me about getting involved in the field of of surgical hair restoration, who contacted me about ways to expand their practice by getting into hair. And their main question to me, all of them after this aesthetics meeting was, what should I get, the neograft or the artist? 
And my initial response to these guys, all of them, were to tell them that, listen, this is a serious undertaking. This isn't a joke. It's not a turnkey system. You can just get this machine in your practice and all of a sudden start doing hair transplants and have the results come out the way that they're supposed to come out. I was talking to this one guy. I'm like, what happens if you have a complication? Have you ever even seen a hair transplant in person? This guy said no. But according to the manufacturers, it's a very simple procedure. And hey, listen, you know what? These guys are board certified plastic surgeons. They're they're real surgeons. They perform complicated surgeries every day. To them, hair transplantation is nothing. And that is where the problem lies. Now, I've convinced these guys to really do their, their homework, really understand what they're getting involved in. Uh, for me, out of the two, I think the artist is a lot more, it's, it's, it's virtually dummy proof as far as removing the grafts. So if you're going to get something, that's probably the, 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 the direction to go in, into. Can't speak tonight. But I also explained to them, and this one guy in particular, I said, it took you 20 years to build your reputation as a board-certified plastic surgeon. It's just going to take one miserable hair transplant patient to destroy it. You better know what you're getting into. Because if you don't know what you're doing, and you claim that you do, and someone comes out with a bad result, not only is the patient screwed, but you're screwed as well. And I think it is so important that these companies, that Restoration Robotics and the good doctors in the field really take the time to educate the guys who are going to get into this field because it's going to happen. This field is changing rapidly. And in my view, you know who's going to suffer the most? You guys. The guys who think they're getting state-of-the-art surgical hair restoration because they went to a guy that has a machine as opposed to a guy that may have the same machine but actually has the staff and the training and the ability to deal with everything and every aspect of surgical hair restoration. Understanding the anatomy of the scalp and the anatomy of hair and the direction of, 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 of graft placement and all the nuances of surgical hair, hair restoration, you can't be taught that in a weekend course. And this machine at this point cannot perform the entire surgery for you. Phone number is 888-659-3727. I'm sorry if I'm ranting, but I think it's important that you guys know what's happening in the field. This is the way that it's going. There's no stopping it. So you know what I want to do? I want to make it a safer place for everybody. And I want doctors who are involved. I want the guys who are part of the IHRS, the guys that are jumping on board the artist because they believe it's a, it's a good device, it's a good machine to have in their practice, but they already know how to perform surgical hair restoration. So in their hands, it's going to be great. But there's a certain responsibility because as soon as they get it, then the manufacturers of these devices are going to the plastic surgeons and the cosmetic surgeons and saying, hey, look at this guy. He's been doing hair transplants for 25 years, and he's a leader in the field, and he's using our device. He's using this robot. You could do the same thing as he's, that, that he's doing. Triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. Let's see who this is. Hey, man, you're on the air. Hey, Spencer, man. Great to hear your voice. It's Vic from D.C. Hey, Vic, man. What's going on? Oh, it's great, man. Um, you know, summer's here. Summer always feels better. Um, I don't know about you. I know you live in California, but over here in D.C., our winters are long and cold. So when the summer's Dude, I, here... I, I, I used to live in D.C. I lived, I lived in Bethesda, Maryland. It, it sucks. Oh, yeah. It's cold. You live in a much better place now. I'm sure the weather in California is at least pretty nice throughout the year. It's... Uh, it's you know what? It's beautiful here. I love Southern California. I would never move back east um, unless I was being paid a lot of money. There's no way I would do it. Well, 
I wanted to call in tonight because I watch your program every single Tuesday, but you started off with a really good topic tonight, and I thought I should call in um, yeah. again for the view for the viewers who um, have heard me before. Of course, I j- just want to reiterate, Spencer. Spencer helped me get through it. So I'm on the other end of the spectrum. I watch the show because I'm still interested and I like Spencer. And it never hurts to learn more. So I wanted to call in because you're talking about the artist. And uh, once in a while, I log into the, I uh, go into the forums right. and your Ball Truth website. Right. And recently, I saw this really great thread on there, um, of talking about FUE. And um, there were some really good points made. One of the members, it might have, I forget the name, was talking pretty much directly with Dr. Cole on there about FUE. And right. um, very interesting because um, the, uh, I know that you believe in the truth and you want us to, to know the truth. And that's why I feel so comfortable talking to you. Yeah, yeah. The, of course. Uh, the, the the thread was so eye opening. I always had a deep amount of respect for the artist from the standpoint that it's when you have a computer precision on on depth scoring and all of these things. I think that the quality of the, the quality of the graphs are going to be great. But the point that Dr. Cole brought up on the thread was that. At certain angles, the transaction is almost um, impossible to avoid. He was saying on the side of the side of the head and at certain angles and stuff, and that made me think. Well, you know what? I don't know what the best solution is right now. If someone like me, who's like a Norwood six, say at some point in the future wants to do it, should they go artist, or I mean, any ro- robot, or should they? Should they stick to manual FUE? And I remember Joe Tronic on the forums, even once, he said he was so scared of of sitting under the artist. He said that he would get a um, surgeon to manually do it because his, his concern was what if that device is just screws up and what if that punch just gets stuck in a scalp? I mean, there's... I, I, I think I, those are all. I mean, those are all incredibly valid points. And I will tell you that you know, I feel the same way. And initially, I really felt the same way. I have learned a lot more about the way the artist works now. And I, it, this is important that you guys know this. Dr. Cole has been recommended by the IHRS since the beginning. He's one of our founding members. He's a guy that I have tremendous respect for. He tells it like he thinks it is. And when I say – what I'm saying is he truly believes in everything that he's saying. He's very passionate and he will go out on the limb and even put his neck on the line to get his points out there. One point that was made um, many times online is that the artist, because it's a robot, it cannot move with the patient when the patient breathes, when the patient may, you know, uh, hiccup, when the patient may have any type of movement, the artist is already set. It's not going to move. I was under that impression as well until I learned more about the machine. And basically, the machine is, if it's working properly, and I think Joe Tronic has a great point, it is actually geared to move along with the patient. Once it targets that graft, even if the patient breathes, hiccups, moves to the side, it will stall and move with the patient and still be able to focus and then extract that graft. That was a revelation when I found that out. And it was Bob Bernstein who not only told me that, but proved that to me. So that alone, I, I was like, wow, okay, well, that's, that's a pretty intuitive machine if that's the case. And it seems like that is the case. But Joe's, well, Joe's oh, yeah. point, Joe's point, I'm sorry to cut you off, is really... You know, I mean, it makes sense to me. It's like, okay, what happens if something goes haywire with this machine? And then all of a sudden, this, you know, it's, it's punching out, uh, you know, 10 extra graphs or just kind of lost focus or whatever it is. There are safety mechanisms uh, for the device. And frankly, if it's being run properly, the 
person, the, the physician is supposed to be able to stop it as soon as there is an issue. So as long as the doctor has his eye on the ball, that's not going to happen. However, listen, these, they're human, doctors are human beings, and so are technicians. Maybe they looked at their watch for a second. Maybe they're do, doing it. Maybe they're texting. Should they be? No. So there's always, a, but there's always a possibility. But that can happen during any surgery as well. So oh, yeah. I think oh, yeah. Joe's points are good, and I think John Cole makes some really good points. But I'm learning more and more about this device, and I think that those issues aren't the main issues that I'd be concerned about. There's other issues like size of the punches, what potential, oh, yeah. what potential peripheral damage can be done to you know to adjacent grafts. Uh, are these you know are these going to be issues? you know, for the second or for the third pass. You know, anyone could have one good FUE result. That's easy. But what about two passes or three passes? Are we going to have a shotgun effect? You know, there's one doctor here in Los Angeles who contacted me, and, and I'm going to let you speak in a second, Vic, because I know that you have, you have some important things to say. In, no, no problem. No problem. But there's one doctor contacted me, and he asked me, and I'm going to, Actually, two guys contacted me. One guy t- contacted me in Los Angeles and said he was considering getting the artist. Uh, the salesman came out. He knows a lot of guys in the area are getting it. After seeing some of the work, and the work that he saw were from doctors who were not part of the IHRS and who weren't even in the hair world for a long time. These were just guys who got their hands on it. It scared him. He didn't like what was happening in the donor area. And I told, oh. but, I, but what I did tell him was I did see the donor area of someone from an IHS member who's been using it, and the donor area looks pretty pretty clean. So it's possible that whoever was using the device was miscalibrating it. I don't know, but the point is there can be mistakes made, and unless someone is really skilled at surgical hair restoration, I believe they shouldn't even touch this device. Oh, uh, exactly, exactly, and. Um uh, and like you said, I mean, and that's the great thing about your show and the great thing about the IHRS is that everyone's given a free voice because I remember that, um, uh, maybe last week, a couple of weeks ago, you had Alan Bauman on yeah. and I know he uses the neograft right. and I think that he believes strongly in the neograft. And then there are other doctors, I think maybe Bob Bernstein who says the neograft's not good. He thinks it's, cr- he thinks it's doc- crap, and he'll say it on the air. And then there are other doctors like John Cole who believe um, in his own device that he made. And then, you know, so what I really like is that the f- everyone, nothing is filtered. That's what's so amazing about your show. Everything is given to the consumer. That's so amazing. And the second thing that's so amazing is that well, this is actually amazing, and it's like it makes uh, the consumers have to do even more due diligence. Now that FUE has so many different approaches, some people just use the punch. I think, I think one of your recommended doctors, I think doctor might be Dr. Feller, still uses a like manual, like he'd have to score, he'd have to actually well, go in. He uses his own, he has his own motorized, handheld, wireless device. It's basically a battery-driven device that he uses, and he uses uh, and ha- handheld punches. But he also, and he'll be, he'll be the first to tell you, he's kind of stepped away from FUE, just like a lot of doctors have who have been in it. And he was one of the first guys to really embrace it because he believes that strip which is like a, a four-letter word now, at least you know, it's a dirty word, is still a superior procedure for most patients who are equipped to have a, uh, a linear scar. You know, And there's a lot right. of guys that believe that too. And Bob Bernstein, who more than 50% of his practice now, or about 50% of his practice, is FUE, he still believes that strip is really, you know, if he had a choice, if it was a family member in most cases or whatever, and they were the right candidate for a strip, he would say that you're going to get a better end result with more robust grafts and more DHT-resistant hair that could be moved using this procedure. So I think Alan Feller, Alan Feller is in that belief too. Well. It, I think it's just great that, you know, I know you had Dr. Yates, I know you had Alan Bauman, um, Bob Bernstein, Feller, everyone, and everyone has their opinion. Um, and I think at the end of the day, 
I think every every one of them are going to have great results. The real question is, I guess it depends patient to patient. Well, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Is it really patient to patient, or is there really a like the most? Is there? Do you think that eventually there will be a most ideal FUE protocol? I think there might be a more ideal FUE protocol, but no matter what you do, FUE is a, is a blind technique. Currently, what's happening in the industry is a, a very strong um, uh, marketing effort to reach consumers and to get consumers to make that choice. And the choice is, do I want a scar on the back of my head or do I want a so-called scarless procedure? And to the average consumer, the choice is very clear. I don't want a scar in my head. Why would I want that? This is state of the art. I'm going to go to somebody who uses this neograft or this robot because this is what's being marketed as state of the art. Makes sense. I understand the business model. And the truth is consumers really led the way. It all started on the, in the online world when you know some very vocal guys who were – literally butchered by some of the bad guys in the industry, um, you know, they called for a less invasive procedure. And to repeat myself for the thousandth time, you know, when Ray Woods contacted me in 98, 99 and showed me this Woods technique and I, I showed this to other doctors who thought I was crazy initially, you know, once some of these other doctors embraced it and once Woods really got online, and started to, you know, um, you know, put his information out there. This flow of information really went all over the internet and really started to kind of uh, permeate the, the industry. And more and more guys were getting involved, and they figured, in my view, some of the guys that got involved initially thought, you know what? People want this. We're going to do this because we're going to make more money. Some guys got involved because they thought it was a better procedure, but I don't think that was the case for a lot of the guys. I think it was it was like, okay, we're going to give – patients want a choice. This seems interesting. We're going to do it and we're going to offer it to patients. And what happened, especially in 2001, 2002, 2003, a lot of patients came away with some pretty shitty results. But the mm -hmm. momentum was there. So for a while, things got a lot better. The guys who really were doing FUE were doing FUE well. The guys who chose not to do FUE and focus on strip, like Hassan Wong, for instance, they were doing stellar work. Everyone kind of had their place in the field. And, you know, while we saw the field was kind of going in the FUE direction, it wasn't really being forced. Then these machines started to come out, manufacture, these guys who started to manufacture these so-called automated devices. And then there was a whole new shift of marketing. And then again, marketing came out. Consumers spoke their mind. They wanted state of the art. Anyone who was doing strip were butchers, but no one really understood what the the long term ramifications were going to be. A lot of guys who get it, who got FUE over the years from guys who weren't skilled or who didn't have experience, they're fucked now. It's over. They would have been much better off getting a strip by someone who knew what they were doing. Oh yeah. So to answer your question, I think things are going to improve. But it's also important to know, and I'm telling you what the trends are, and the trend is strip will eventually disappear. And it's not because it should disappear. It's because of the market, and it's because of money. Oh, right. It's because of money, and it's because of consumer demand. And in the end, I don't think people are going to get as good as, uh, as you know, general results as they would – if strip was still in the picture. I think a combination of two for the right candidate, you're going to get the most bang for your buck and the most hair for your buck. FUE will always have its limitations when it comes to DHT-resistant hair until they can make new hair. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Spencer. I just want to conclude. I just want to... I know you have a lot of callers and a doctor caller. I just want to conclude by uh, saying thank you. And, of course... To the listeners, um, some of you have heard me in the past that Spencer really, really helped me. I'm on, I'm on, I'm at this stage in life where because of Spencer's help, and remember, I can't, I can't just go to anyone and talk to them about this. The public doesn't doesn't understand um, the emotional impact that hair loss has. So Spencer's really, really helped me. Now I'm at this phase in life where 
Um, I've moved on, but I still follow the show. I still keep up with research because it interests me. I'm kind of like the Joe from Staten Island who has accepted hair loss, but still researches it. So I want to thank Spencer. And also you guys should keep tuning in because this is the best show on the internet. Well, dude, I, I, first of all, I appreciate you saying that. And I'm so glad that we were able to help you. You know, I remember when you first called in a few years ago and, and how desperate you were to, uh, excuse me, to, to have a hair transplant and how desperate you were to, to, to make that move. And when you told me your situation, I was like, dude, this isn't good for you, man. Spencer, you single-handedly kept me out of the surgeon seat. Single-handedly kept me out of the surgeon seat. And now, four years later, that was the best thing anyone could have ever done to me. So thank it's you, four years. I can't believe it. Well, listen, I'm glad, we were, I'm glad we were able to help. And I think it's important that, you know, you're an example that sometimes when you wait, you can kind of come to terms with things and you realize, you know what, it, it, it wouldn't have made me happier. Now, even if you got a little bit more hair, you know, the fact that you're able to live your life, be happy, be content just the way you are, it's so much better than having to go through the emotional and the financial and all of the, you know, everything else that's attached to having surgery. So I, I'm happy for you, man. I'm glad that you were able to come to terms with it. Thank you, Spencer. And um, just uh, just one last thing. I'm sorry for keeping you. Uh, no, it's okay. But, I'm going to go to a break in a second. Um, so go ahead, whatever you want to say. Um, I just wanted to say, just reiterate the last point you made. Uh, one thing I've noticed is that when I'm feeling good, when the other aspects of my life are going good, I'm working out, uh, work's great. I'm feeling good about myself and the other areas. Sometimes hair loss just disappears from my mind. So I want people to know that too. Sometimes you have to get to a good feeling place and then the perspective on the problem that you think is your problem will be a lot different. So I just wanted to conclude by that. Thank you again for having me on, Spencer. You have a great night. You got it, man. Listen, well said and thanks for the call. Take care. Take care. Triple eight six five nine three seven two seven. I don't know if uh, Glenn Charles is going to call in or not. Um, it's possible that he's st stuck late in the office, or he, uh, you know, maybe stuck in traffic, or maybe he f forgot the number, or whatever. But uh, he was supposed to call the first hour, so I'm not going to count on that. But I did want to talk about this, and I'm glad that uh, you know that we got a call about the artists and about what's happening in the field. I just don't think people truly understand the, the magnitude of what's happening in the field. Not even the doctors. Just give you a little story before I take a break. San Diego doctor called me, IHS member, said to me, look, I really, you know, there was a, a guy next door who is a cosmetic surgeon. He got, he got his hands on one of these devices and now he's doing hair transplants. I do FUE by hand. And, you know, basically told me that he felt almost pressured to get into the game by getting one of these devices. He asked me which one he should get. And I told him the truth that, you know, he is a, you know, an IHS member. He's been doing hair transplants for a long time. He knows what he's doing. He has the right staff. So if you're going to make the choice, my choice would be the artist system and you know, and that's it. And then as far as the marketing aspect of things, you win. Plus, you're already, uh, uh, you know, doing uh, surgical hair restoration for a long period of time. So you don't have to worry about your competition. That's what it's coming down to. To me, it's sad. It really is. I'm not saying that the artist is not going to be beneficial to some people. And I think it's getting better. But this is the way the market is going. And if you're considering having surgery, you have to realize that. It's not necessarily, in my view, that it's state of the art. It's just the way that it's going. It's just happening. So for all you doctors who are watching, all you doctors who are listening, I really hope that you listen to what I'm saying because this is what is going to happen. The industry is spreading out. The good guys... The guys in the IHS and some of the guys who may not be in the IHS but are still doing good work, the business is going elsewhere. 
because there are, go there are going to be people out there who don't have your experience but have the same machine that you have. And the consumer is not going to understand the difference. Now, they'll get the difference when they find us. But there are going to be more ads on television. There's going to be more ads in the back of magazines. There's going to be more in-flight ads and much more confusion. And what's going to happen? Sometimes when something is in someone's face, they don't do their due diligence. They don't do the research they think they need to do. And to me, this is going to harm the entire field. It's going to harm many patients. There are going to be thousands of walking wounded. Unless you doctors kind of get together and figure out a way to, you know, work with the guys who aren't in the specialty, who are going to get their hands on this device, and train them. To me, that's the only way people aren't going to be harmed. Sadly, I doubt that's going to happen. 888-659-3727. Going to take a break. When we come back, we'll take some more phone calls. That's 888 that's hard for me too. 888-659-3727. I'm Spencer Coburn. You're listening to and watching The Ball Truth. Stay with us. He's an international best-selling author, a contributing editor for Consumer Digest magazine, and the host of the longest-running reality radio show for men. I'd say he's the man. The truth shall set you free. It's Spencer Coburn's The Ball Truth. Hey guys, welcome back. 888-659-3727. My phone was blowing up after the last segment, which is wild. You know, it's like, look, I know that I'm involved in this industry. But I think it's important for the physicians to know and also for the manufacturers of these devices to understand that I am not here to sell surgery. And for me... Surgery sells itself. If I'm here telling the truth about what's happening in the field, if I'm here informing people about how the field is evolving, and you know what, I may not agree with the direction that the field is evolving in, but this is where it's going. It is not going to keep people from having surgery who are good candidates for surgery and who really want surgery. I think Vic is, a, is an example of a guy who wasn't a great candidate for surgery, who probably didn't really want surgery, but believed that this is his option. This is what was going to benefit his life. I spoke to him about his choices, and after assessing his situation through conversation as a non-physician, as a layman, I advised him that in my view, surgery was not for him. And you know what that did? That gave him time to sit back and take a look at his life and think whether or not I may be right. And you know what? In his view, it was the right choice not to have surgery. But I could, be, I could give the same advice to somebody else and they're gonna have surgery. So for the few guys that just contacted me who are concerned about me speaking about the artists or speaking about people not having surgery, you should listen to the show more often because that's what I do. You know, this is what I do. This is how I make my living. Being able to sleep at night, that's what I do. There's no need to sell surgery. Cosmetic surgery sells itself. It's much better that patients are, patients are informed, that they understand what's going on, that they know that, you know, it's every doctor and everybody in the field is jockeying for their own position. There are some doctors that go online and they pander to message forms, which I, I totally disagree with. But it works for them, so they do it. I don't know, maybe I'm saying too much. But you know, that's why I do this program. 
That's it's it's not just a a way to to market the bald truth and to to get you know to get get my word out there so people go to our resources and I've been doing this for a long time for one reason and one reason only because I believe that if people are well informed they will make the best decisions for their lives. I've been informing people about my experience on finasteride for years. And people are up in arms because I tell the truth about my experience and the experience of those who have contacted me over the years who have done well on the drug. That doesn't negate the experience of those who are, who are, who are suffering because of the drug. Now that I'm on that subject, I mean, I, I, I recently got um, contacted by somebody who was very civil, which is unusual, but wanted to talk about their experience on Finasteride and that they had a really bad experience. And what struck me about this is when he contacted me and I actually decided to speak to him by phone, he is now unsure as to whether that experience was somehow caused or influenced by others who had similar experiences to his. Because when he initially got on the drug, he wasn't experiencing any adverse side effects. I said, I have no idea if your side effects are real or not, but they're real to you because they're happening. But he told me a very, very interesting story. I'm not going to get into the entire story on the air. But the bottom line is he started to take this drug. He was fine. He read about the side effects and actually contacted somebody that's very vocal online. And then all of a sudden he started to freak out and he began to really suffer. And now he's off the medication and he's still suffering. Now his concern is whether or not his mind is going to, like, he's going to be able to be freed up, you know, uh, from this anxiety, and if that's what's causing it, or if there's some, some real physiological damage. Goes on to tell me that he went to see a doctor that he found online, and now he believes that this particular doctor may be taking advantage of his situation. Now, I had no commentary on this particular doctor. But I will say that in my view that there are physicians out there that are and attorneys that are taking advantage of these vulnerable guys. And some of these guys who are being taken advantage of may actually be suffering from real side effects. Some of these doctors aren't taking insurance. They're making these cats pay cash. They're putting them on some pretty dangerous things, supplements and, and drugs to try to reverse what's happening to them. So anyway, the whole thing's a mess. All I can say is this. This program is about trying to get the truth out there. Trying to discuss and get you guys the information. And yes, as I see it, because this is, this is what I do. I'm the one who's behind the mic. I try to be fair. I try to look at all sides of the equation, whether it's with surgery, whether it's with medication, whether it's with, you know, anything that's happening on the forums. But even when you're watching this program, you have to take whatever is said on this show and, you know, digest it and then go on and do more research. I mean, I don't know everything. I know what I know. You know what I do know? I know this industry. I know what's being sold to you guys. I know when I go onto the message form and I read some of the threads, guys talking about some of these gray market and even some of these bullshit products that people are discussing and writing about on their websites with this pseudo, pseudo, pseudo scientific jargon and these poor vulnerable guys are reading this and then putting it out 
on these message forums, including mine, for, for more public consumption for, so more young guys can read this and get false hope. And it becomes this vicious cycle. I do know that I've been doing this for a long time, and most of the stuff that you read online is bullshit. But when I say that, people don't like to hear it. They somehow think that I just want to hold on to this industry, that I want to hold on to conventional hair transplants because that's the, that's the way that Coburn makes his money. And if, he's, if he allows you know, a, a conversation or if he, if he promotes something that's unconventional, then it's going to hurt his pocketbook. The truth is if I promote something that's unconventional, I'll make more money. If I promote donor graft regenerate donor hair regeneration i can guarantee you guarantee you the money will be flowing i can open up a clinic here in los angeles people fly in from around the world and i can say that we are doing a procedure that regenerates donor hair based on these findings, based on this paper and this study and this doctor's experience and work. And for at least two years, we will rake in the cash. I can tell my doctors in the IHRS, hey, listen, there's a guy in Europe that's claiming to do uh, hair follicle regeneration. Follow his lead. It's easy. People will flock to you. They're not going to know the difference. They're not going to know if their hair is regenerating. They're just going to think that it is. That's what's happening in this industry. That's what's been happening since I got into the field. And it goes into cycles. So I just want you guys to be really careful out there. Now I'm going to, um, and I told Andrew this, I'm basically going to do an hour broadcast tonight. I was waiting for Joe to call in to give him a little time, but um, I don't think he's going to call in, so I'm not going to take any other calls. And I just wanted to let you guys in on what is happening in the field. That's it. And, you know, maybe what I'm going to do with my program from now on is kind of do like a weekly address to you guys. It's nice. I'm glad that Vic called in. I'm glad the other guys may, may want to call and ask some questions. But as I see everything starting to, to move in, certain, in a certain direction, I really think you guys need to maybe get your ass kicked a little bit and learn about the reality of what's going on and what you're reading on these forums. Half of what you read is complete bullshit. Half of what you read is, is posted by anonymous people trying to control the flow of information. And the fact that some of you guys don't know that is just, it's, it's unbelievable to me. The bottom line is you need to be safe out there. Hair is, it's, obviously it's a big issue. Hair loss sucks. There's no doubt about it. I wouldn't be here if hair loss didn't affect me in the way that it did, especially when I was a young man. But there is life after hair loss. You guys can figure it out without being ripped off, without being disfigured. And the truth is, even if you go to the best doctor, the best of the best, there's always a chance of a complication. And if you can't deal with that, don't even consider having surgery. I mean, what do you think a doctor's going to say? You're going to walk into their exam room and they're going to say, you know, they've performed thousands of surgeries, a lot of these guys. And in their estimation... If you're a good candidate, everything's going to go fine. They'll talk to you about the complications to some degree, but they're not going to emphasize that there's a possibility of compl complications. You guys need to know that yourselves so that if there is a complication, you don't, you don't think your life is over and that you made the biggest mistake because in most cases, especially when you're going to a good physician who has a good team and who really understands how to manage complications, chances are you can be repaired. That sucks if that happens, but you have to be emotionally prepared for that possibility. Otherwise, you shouldn't have surgery. That's my weekly address. That's, that's what I decided to do this week. You know, when I 
get these calls from these doctors who just, I mean, they're just not in the field and they want to get into the field. I think to myself, holy shit, it, just, it never ends. No matter what we do, all you new guys, new guys in the chat room, new guys who are in, in, in GFQ chat, new guys in the forum, you think there's some sort of set protocol. Like these are all the good guys and these are all the bad guys. And the, this is the way, you know, the, things are supposed to go. And you have, you know, these things that work and these things that don't. And in many cases, that's true. I mean, to some degree, that's true. You have Finasteride, you have Rogaine. You have a handful of guys doing great surgical hair restoration. You have great hair pieces, which they don't seem to talk about a lot on our forum which they should because it's a, it's a great, it can give people a really great opportunity to live their lives without having to go under the knife and to give that a shot, but a lot of guys don't want to do that. But not everything is black and white. Just because someone is listed and part of what I do and a member of the International Alliance of Hair Restoration Surgeons doesn't mean that you're going to be complication-free. And again, if you can't understand that, that things aren't black and white, and that these are just all great starting points, that we developed resources to help you guys make smart decisions, then you got to move on, man. You guys got to move on, shave your heads, and live your lives, because there's no promises. I'm going to give out the websites. Theballtruth.com, for, for all you guys who want to watch archived broadcasts of this broad, of this show, archived, archived shows of this broadcast, whatever. You can go to the American Hair Loss Association website, which is AmericanHairLoss.org, get information, basic information about hair loss, surgical hair restoration. And if you want to interact with other hair loss sufferers, you can go to the Balltruth, BallTruthTalk.com, which is our official forum. Now, it's quasi-private. I know some guys complain about not being able to get in. Just be patient. If you are a reasonable person and you are, you know, someone who appears to be wanting to contribute to the community, then you're going to get in. You're going to be able to be a part of things. But always take what you read on the message forums with a grain of salt. It is great, it's a great place to learn, to share, and to speak to some professionals in the field and to see images and videos from some of the best hair transplant doctors in the world. But you can't take everything that's written, even on our forum, as the gospel. I want you guys to, uh, to be cool this week, to take care, and you know, to realize, listen, life is short. Hair loss sucks. There's no doubt about it. But there is life after hair loss. And, you know, if you focus on other things, like Vic said, you can get through it. And you could also feel, learn to feel comfortable in your own skin without your hair. Now, I couldn't initially. That's why I paint my head, wear a ton of hairspray. And luckily, Finasteride has been working for me for so long. You just have to understand the reality of your situation and know that I think what we have today is miraculous compared to what I was offered 20 years ago. You young guys are lucky. So I want you to think about that. Until next time, be strong, God bless, and thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for any inconvenience you may have been put to prior to the program, and I'm glad you enjoyed it. And if you could now leave by the exits at the rear, that would be splendid. Thank you. Good night.